Amen. All right, I want to begin this whole series on freedom by asking a question, and it's this. What is Christianity supposed to do to a person? Think about it for a moment. You get a gym membership, what's that supposed to do? I mean, if you actually go, what it's, what's it supposed to do to you? You're supposed to get stronger, right? You, you, you change your diet a little bit. You start eating vegetables. This is a funny story. Well, I'm going. Let's just go. My wife's not here. We're going. My, my daughter's fiance, okay, ate a salad for the first time like in his life. She finally convinced him to eat a salad. He blacked out that night in the shower, cut his face. I thought my daughter had decked him. Cut his face in the shower and banged up his knee. They think he had a seizure or something. I'm like, so he's got now this whole argument of why he's never going to eat vegetables again. (laughs) Anyways, you eat healthy. What's it supposed to do? It's supposed to make you healthy, right? So the question is, what is Christianity supposed to do to a person? If you buy in, if you receive, if you believe, what's it supposed to do? I want to suggest to you that what Scripture teaches is that it's supposed to make you free. That really at the essence of Christianity is this word freedom. No, 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 it's salvation. Well, what do you think salvation is? Salvation is the freedom from the penalty of sin. It's what we call justification. We're going to talk about justification this morning. It's called justification that we, Scripture says, earned a wage with our sin. And Scripture says that the wages of our sin is death, eternal separation from God, hell. Jesus came and he took that penalty upon himself so that we would never have to experience it. Salvation is freedom from the penalty of sin. But it goes beyond just that because salvation also means the freedom from the power of sin in your life. How many of y'all ever got, you know, you got saved, you gave your life to Jesus, I'm forgiven, but then you still live like hell? Because there's just, there's stuff in you still. You, you were freed, released from the penalty of sin, but then you began this process of learning how to be set free from the power of sin. We call that process sanctification. These are good theological terms that all of us should grab hold of and and know. Now, justification takes place in a moment. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Instantaneously done, sealed forever. According to Ezekiel 36, you're given a whole new heart, new spirit. You come to life. You once were dead. It's something that happens, happens, happens miraculously, and it's boom, instantaneous. Sanctification is a process that takes place over time. You are less sanctified today than you're going to be tomorrow, but you're more sanctified today, hopefully, than you were yesterday. Reminds me of that old 60s song, I love you more today than yesterday, but not as much as tomorrow, right? That's sanctification. It's a growing thing. It's a process. It takes time. Now, here's the thing. Justification is a work simply and only and completely of Jesus, okay? I mean, just think about it. What part did you contribute to your salvation? You sinned a lot. That was the part that you contributed to your salvation, right? We just, we just sinned. Then Jesus came along, lived a perfect life, died the death that we should have died. He did all the work. Now, do we have a part to play in our justification? Yes. It's believing that Jesus is who he says he is, the Son of God, the Savior, and that he did what he said he did. He died on a cross for your place. All we do is we go, Jesus, you're right, I'm wrong, and I receive what you want to do for me. Okay? Now, in sanctification, it's a whole different thing. In sanctification, there's a partnership relationship with, with, with the Lord. There's a partnership relationship with the Holy Spirit. Really, in, in sanctification, you get to choose how free you want to be. You get to choose how much like Jesus you want to become. Freedom is not something that God forces on you. 
It's something that he desires for you. And in fact, I think it's something he commands us to, to learn how to walk in. But it's not something that he forces. It's not something that he just accomplishes in a moment for you, typically. Now, there are some encounters that we have where the Holy Spirit just comes. And, you know, I've heard stories of people in a moment being delivered from drug addiction. Just boom, done. Right? But typically, the sustainable kind of freedom that we're going after is coupled with uh, coupled of, of, of an experience with the Holy Spirit, of God coming with his power, but also a combination of tools that he gives us so that we learn how to walk out that freedom. Okay? You guys remember the story of Israel being set free from Egypt? Love that story. I was just reading to my, my youngest daughter, Reese, the story of Moses. She's got this cool little Bible that's a coloring book. So I read and she colors the picture at the same time. It's just, it works great for her right now. And, and the story of Israel being set free from Egypt, so fascinating because God's goal was to set his people free from slavery. He, he came in and through Moses delivered them out of the bondage, out of the slavery of Egypt. But how many of you know that wasn't his only goal? Because Israel got out of Egypt, got out of slavery, but the slavery hadn't gotten out of them yet, right? That took them about 40 years. They they kept acting like slaves even though they had been set free. You guys ever see the movie Shawshank Redemption? It's one of those things as a pastor, you can never fully recommend a movie because you're going to guarantee to offend somebody. So I'm not recommending this movie, but it might change your life, okay? So <laughs> Shawshank Redemption, you get the main character, and, and then you've got uh, uh, the character Red. Um, it's played by Morgan Freeman, I believe it is. And, and in this movie, you know, there's the main character, I forget what his name is, but he gets wrongfully imprisoned for about 19 years, and he's got this whole plan of where he finally escapes and everything gets redeemed. It's a great picture of of what God does for us. But he befriends this guy, Red, who's an older gentleman, has been in prison almost his entire uh, adult life. And so he finally gets released, and he gets a job working as a bagger at a grocery store. And he calls over his boss uh, as he's working. He says, boss, boss, can can I take a restroom break? And the boss comes over and says, Red, I've told you this over and over and over again. You don't have to ask my permission to go to the bathroom. Just go. And Morgan Freeman makes this incredible statement. He looks at him and he says, Boss, I've been in jail for 30 some odd years. For 30 years, I've had to ask to do anything. I can't squeeze a drop without your permission. (laughs) Now, it's a little crass, I know. But the point is so profound. He'd been released from prison. He'd been released from slavery in essence, but the slavery was still inside of him, right? He was still walking in the same bondage that he had been walking in. It's the same way for us. We get set free through justification, through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. We are forgiven. We are made righteous. I mean, I love that verse. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him, right? In a moment, saved, have heaven to look forward to, have a relationship with our Father, set free. But then there's that whole process of sanctification where God now needs to walk us through getting the slavery out of us, getting the sin out of us, getting the power of sin broken in our lives. And it's so important because here's what happens for some of us. We, we preach a sermon on freedom and people are like, it was finished at the cross. I don't need freedom. I'm free. Jesus said, it is finished. There's nothing left to do. There was a story in John chapter 8. So fascinating. Jesus is, is speaking to a bunch of Jewish people and a lot of them begin to follow Jesus. And, and Jesus looks at them and he makes this incredible statement. It's really kind of a foundational verse when we're looking at freedom. But in John chapter 8, verse 32, he says, You're going to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How many of you know that every form of bondage is based upon you believing a lie? From the most demon-possessed person to someone that's just struggling with a bad habit, bad pattern, whatever it is. 
It's all based upon believing in a lie. And so Jesus says, look, guys, you're going to know the truth. And as you come into not just knowing it mentally, but experientially knowing the truth, it's going to set you free. Now, the Jews didn't like this. And they make one of the stupidest comments recorded in all of Scripture. They said, but we're descendants of Abraham. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? Has anyone ever read the Old Testament? <laughs> you know, you got to look with like a fine-toothed comb for a season when they weren't enslaved to some nation or the other. And right now they're under a Roman emperor who's completely bonkers out of his mind. We've never been enslaved. Okay, and you go, we look and we go, that's the silliest thing ever. But then... Some of us make the same comment. <laughs> it's finished at the cross, bro. I'm not enslaved. I don't need freedom. It's all been taken care of. Now, if I sit up here, I make that statement, okay? Especially if you guys know me, you know, some of you that know me a little bit better than others. I, come, I don't need freedom. I've never been enslaved to anything. Christ took care of it all at the cross. If you look at me like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard you say, Ryan. You have no idea how much freedom you need right now. You have no idea how much bondage you're in. And here's the thing. Did Jesus take care of it all at the cross? Yes. yes. Justification. Does that mean that we are completely set free from the power of sin the moment that we are set free from the penalty of sin? No. Just take a look at your life. You know this experientially. I mean, I could just start calling out things. Anger, control, rejection, I mean, we can go on and on and on of the things that we're still fighting a battle against inside of us. We need freedom. But here's the thing. The basis of all freedom, true freedom, sustainable freedom, is the work of Christ on the cross. When we're talking about getting free, we're not talking about striving we're not talking about coming up with some special mantra, incantation, that if I just pray the right prayer in the right way, you know, I'm going to be left alone and I'm going to finally be free. No, 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 no. What we're talking about when, when we're looking at freedom is always looking back to the finished work of Christ on the cross and taking what he accomplished, freedom from the penalty of sin. And we're saying, look, that's not all you accomplish. You also accomplish freedom for the power of sin and I want to experience that power today so I'm looking back to the cross I'm going to take what you did Jesus that finished work and I'm going to apply it to this area that I'm struggling with in my life it's not based my freedom is not based upon who I am it's based upon who he is my freedom is not based upon what I can do it's based upon what he's already done for me we're just saying look spirit body soul enemy even you need to come into conformity with what Christ has accomplished for me on the cross. We see these things, and they're just they're out of line. They, they don't have the legal right to be there. And so we're saying, look, I'm taking what Jesus did on the cross, and I'm applying it to this area of bondage that I'm experiencing in my life. Now, why have we been set free? Why did Christ set us free? There's this... Interesting verse, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It honestly kind of seems redundant. This is what he says. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You're like, Paul, are you having a bad day? I mean, <laughs> sound like you're repeating yourself there. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. What Paul is saying is not redundant. What he's saying is, look, I set you free so that you can actually live in freedom. I set you free, justification, not so that you could just wait until you die and get to heaven and be like, oh, I'm finally free. No, I set you free so that you can experientially live in freedom now, sanctification. I set you free from the penalty of sin so that you could be set free from the power of sin now. I set you free so that you could be free indeed, right? Now, this should get us excited. How many of you know living in freedom is a lot more fun than living in bondage? Amen. Just like getting healed from a disease is a lot more fun than staying sick. Jesus said, 
It's for freedom that I set you free. So let's get on board and let's get free. Let's get free. Now, this freedom that we're looking at in this series, again, is what we're calling sustainable freedom. How many of y'all ever had like a moment of freedom or a short season of freedom and then you're right back to where you were, right? I think all of us have. What we want is a freedom that lasts, a freedom where you get set free and it is a freedom for the rest of your life. Yeah, maybe you'll have a couple bumps along the road, but it's a freedom that you know how to maintain. To have a sustainable freedom, there's really two components that have to be in place. The first is what I'm calling education. This is preaching Sunday morning. This is knowledge of of the truth of God's word. This is tools, which we're going to look at in just a moment, tools that have to be in your grasp, in your tool belt, ready to pull out and use, okay? We got to have the knowledge, the understanding. It's important to understand justification and sanctification. Without those things, there's no sustainable, lasting freedom. We got to have the education. But second component of this, this, this mixture is not just the education, it's the experience. We need to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the one that takes what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross and makes it real experientially in our lives. He is the one that applies the power of God to our lives. I mean, Paul, I can't remember what it was. Paul says, you know, he's talking about the resurrection of Christ. And he said, look, I want to suffer like Christ did in death, but I also want to experience the power of the resurrection now. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in you and me, right? And so we need the education, we need the tools, but we need the power and the experience. And what happens for a lot of us is we get free for a moment or for a season because we only have one or the other. I've got all the tools, I've got the formulas, I'm going through my formulas, I'm going through my formulas, I'm going through my formulas! I'm just getting angry and angry at the stupid formulas. Why? Well, because you're operating in your strength and striving. You're just not strong enough to get free. You're just not. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. You guys ever see the video? I came across a YouTube video of a zebra stuck in mud. You guys ever seen that one? You know, he's just going. I guess that was a goat sound, whatever. It's an interesting video. He's stuck in mud, and you see, like, the predators. The lions are around, and they're just like, I'm ready. Lunch. And he can't do anything in his own strength. Every time he tries moving, he's just getting deeper and deeper in the mud, you know? And then there's these, I can't remember what, oh, it was an elephant. An elephant comes up, takes that long trunk, wraps it around the neck of the zebra, and starts pulling and pulls him out of the mud. I mean, it's amazing. YouTube, it's an amazing video. It's kind of the same picture of us when all we have is the formulas. When all we've got are the tools without the experience. All we got is the tools without the power of the Holy Spirit. We're stuck in the mud, but we need the Spirit to come and actually supercharge the tools that we've been given. For these next three weeks... The tools that we're going to be looking at are found in this booklet. If you're watching online, you don't live here, because I know we've got folks in Denmark, Minnesota, forget where else, that are participating in this. This is available online. You can download it. This is the tools. But this by itself is not going to bring true freedom. You need the experience of the power of the Holy Spirit. And part of where that's going to come honestly is through that small group experience. There's something powerful that happens when we take the tools in a group setting and we actually use the tools together and invite the Holy Spirit to move. And if you're serious, remember I said, you get to choose how free you want to get. I'd encourage you, I mean, if you're ready for a new level of freedom, get the tools, but then join one of the groups as well to have that experience coupled together. It's so, so vitally important. Now, when we talk about bondage, slavery, there's almost always, no matter what your form of bondage is, there's almost always one or more of three ingredients that are involved. 
that actually make up your bondage, okay? Sin, which you're all we're pretty, you know, you guys know that the basis of all bondage is sin, right? You're in bondage because you've sinned or somebody has sinned against you. It's, it's sin, okay? But then there's also unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is one of the greatest prisons that sin creates. It's, it's a huge bondage in so many of our, our, of our lives. Ooh, I misspelled judgments. That's what happens when my wife's not here. It's judgments as well. Uh, these three ingredients are just like the death cocktail. <laughs> and if you look at any area of bondage in your life, guaranteed you're going to find one or more of these. And so the tools that we're going to be uh, experiencing together over the next three weeks are tools designed to combat these three areas, these three things, these three components that bring about bondage. And so when we're talking about sin, what's the tool we need? Uh, repentance. We need to repent from the sin that's in our life. And we're going to talk about repentance today. And repentance is so much more than just, sorry God for that one. Sorry God for that one. And we're going to learn how to have some deep repentance so that we can have deep freedom. Amen? And, and so we need that. Unforgiveness, what do we need to do to get free from that? You guys are bright. We, did, we need to forgive. We're going to talk about that next week. How many of you all know forgiveness can be difficult? And we're going to learn how to forgive, but we're going to learn how to go deep so we can just root it all out. And then when we're talking about judgments, the tool is we just need to learn how to break the judgments that we've made against other people. We're going to look at that week three. Now, the way this is going to work, we're going to preach on it Sunday. You're going to take your book, your tools, and it has very, very uh, application-based, simple, step-by-step processes for you to follow in your groups. And your group leaders are going to lead you through how to use these tools and actually how to find freedom. And man, it's going to be great. We Yesterday morning, uh, we spent three hours together training your small group leaders and I told him, I said, this is not practice. You're going to get freedom this morning. <laughs> and then as you experience it using these tools, you're then going to go lead your groups into freedom. And man, it was an awesome time Amen. yesterday. People were getting set free, and it was just a beautiful thing. So they're excited. They're ready to lead you all into that same experience because they've tasted it, and they, they just know how good it is. They're so excited for this. And so what I want to do today, just in in our last few minutes together, is we're going to look at this first tool of repentance and how key it is. I mean, the Bible talks about repentance over and over and over again. Peter's preaching his first sermon on the day of Pentecost, and everyone's just cut to the quick. The Holy Spirit grabs their hearts, and they're just like, what do we got to do? What do we do to be saved? First word out of Peter's mouth, repent. And when we talk about repentance, again, it's not just being sorry for your sin. Truly, repentance is is much more than that. What I want to do for a moment, I actually want to read straight out of the booklet. If you've gotten one already, you can look at it with me. If you haven't, grab one on your way out. But we talk about, in week one here, what repentance is, and it's this. Walking in the freedom of our salvation requires ongoing repentance. You don't just repent of sin you know, once. Why? Because there's more sin in you that you need to repent about, right? Again, justification, sanctification. We repent on a large macro scale level. Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I repent of them. I turn away. Saved in a moment. But when we're talking about that process of getting free, sanctification, when we see the sins come up, the anger, the reject, whatever it might be come up, we need to call it what it is, sin, and we need to repent of that particular one, right? So walking in the freedom of our salvation requires ongoing repentance. It's a word that carries more substance than we sometimes realize. Repentance is literally a change of direction that starts with godly sorrow. It's not about endlessly feeling bad about what you've done. That itself is a stronghold that the Bible calls worldly sorrow. You ever been stuck in that before? This is, okay, this is the great thing about getting free Some are like, man, I don't want to go back there. I'm just going to feel bad and yucky and guilty and shameful. If that's what you feel, you're doing it wrong. It's worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads us to repentance, 
And Peter says repentance always brings about refreshment. That there's a refreshing that comes to us as we repent of those sins and release them, right? So that's a stronghold we don't want, but rather it's a kind of sorrow that opens the door to freedom and true joy. Now, when we talk about repentance, there's really four things. Four, we can call them the four R's, you can kind of call them whatever you want. But when we're talking about repentance, to have deep, true repentance that actually is effective to bring about freedom, four things need to be in place. Number one, you need to recognize and confess your sin. You guys know that Jesus did not die for mistakers. There is no forgiveness for mistakers. There is no freedom for mistakers. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus forgives sinners. Jesus frees sinners. But if you look at your sin and call it mistake, or if you look at your sin and be like, well, you know, it's really not what, it was the circumstances. Did you see what they did to me? If we don't call sin what it is, you're going to be wallowing that thing till the day you die. You can still be justified. But when we get down again to that process of sanctification, we're like, well, it's not, you know, I'm yeah, anger, whatever, but you know, they, it's just because you make me so angry. It's your fault. If you weren't such a, then I wouldn't get angry. No, no, when we're repentant, repenting, it starts with confessing sin for what it is. It's sin, right? And it's our sin. Now, sin can come in a variety of forms. Sin can be uh, an attitude like bitterness, rebellion, or pride. Y'all ever had a bad attitude before? Man, yesterday morning, we had to get my kids up early because we had to go grab coffee from Starbucks to bring down to the freedom training. And my kids are all in the van ready to go, and their attitudes were just straight from the pit of hell. I mean, just... And I'm just like, guys, we're going to teach on freedom. Get it together, you know? So I pull them out of the van, I sit them down, you know, I sit them down in our family room, I'm like, guys, this cannot go on, this is sin. No, it's what they're doing. No, this is sin, and we're going to stop it right now, we're going to pray. So we prayed, and praise God, it broke, their attitudes changed, that does not always happen, <laughs> okay? But it did, but, but our sin can come in the form of an attitude. Uh, bitterness, and, you know, all these things, it, it can be just the attitudes that we put on. But our sin can also, and this is probably the most obvious one, can come in the form of our behavior. Sexual morality, stealing, you know, all these things, we get that. Our sin can also come in the form of a feeling. And this is the one that some of you aren't going to like. Because you say, well, those are just my feelings. It's just how I feel. How can that be sin? Well, feelings like insecurity, Feelings like shame. You're like, well, how, how can insecurity be a sin? Because insecurity is just pride with a mask on. It's pride mixed with self-pity. It's a nasty cocktail. Insecurity is still just me-centered thinking, right? It's sin. You're like, well, how can shame be sin? Well, because it's believing a lie when God's given you the truth that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation, shame, they're brothers, right? The conviction of the Holy Spirit says you did something wrong. Shame says you are something wrong. You don't have the right anymore to say who you are. Only Christ does because you've been bought with the price, his blood, and he belong, you, you belong to him. Not only that, he's the maker creator. The only people that have the right to determine what something is is whoever owns it or whoever made it. God did both. So when we take on shame and condemnation, it's sin, right? And so sin can come in the form of, of feelings as well. Now here's the thing, and this is important to understand. There are times when you have been sinned against and it is absolutely not your fault. Okay? All of us have been sinned against. I know a lot of your stories. There have been atrocious things that have been done to a lot of you. Atrocious things. That's not your sin. But how you respond and how you react to what's been done to you, that oftentimes is your sin. 
If you live your life based on that event, based on that trauma, based on that abuse, and anger, and bitterness, and resentment, and whatever, on and on and on, that's your sin. Now, here, here's the, the difficult part with this, is that when something traumatic happens and we've been sinned against what the enemy loves to do is to come in and create a little safe haven around that event and he says look you can put all your anger in there all your resentment all your gossip i mean how many of you you know there's that person that's done something against you and you just like you can't wait to just to tell your side of the story you can't wait just to point out what they did right and the enemy tries to create this little safe haven and says no no all that stuff is fine it's in the safe haven of the sin that's been done against you it doesn't really count you're fine you can do all these things because they did that that's bondage that's slavery, and the only way to get set free from what's been done against you is forgive, number one, which we'll talk about next week, but you gotta destroy the safe haven. You gotta pull those things out and say, what was done to me was wrong, but my response is equally as wrong. This is sin. I'm gonna call it what it is. I'm gonna repent of it, right? And I'm gonna confess it for what it is. That can be difficult, but it is a brave decision that's going to set you free. So when we're talking about repentance, it begins with confessing and recognizing our sin for what it is. But secondly, moving on, it's receiving God's forgiveness. True repentance is, Jesus, I've sinned, and I ask for your forgiveness, and now I receive your forgiveness. Now, a lot of us theoretically know that we've been forgiven, but we don't live like we've been forgiven. We know it theoretically, not experientially. When we're talking about receiving the forgiveness of God, we're saying we actually feel forgiven. That we're going to declare the truth of God's forgiveness over our lives until our emotions get in line with it. <laughs> that we're going to make Jesus, I receive the forgiveness that you purchased for me on the cross. That you said it is finished. I'm receiving it now, right? We're going to receive that forgiveness and let me just say this, oftentimes, not only do we need to receive forgiveness, but we actually need to forgive ourselves. I know some of you don't like that statement. I get it. Get over it. <laughs> Here's what happens for some of us. Okay, I know God, I know God forgave me, but I can never forgive myself. How dare you? Do you understand what you're doing with that statement? Do you understand what you're doing by keeping yourself on the hook, so to speak, when God has let you off the hook? You're saying, God, your standards just aren't as high as mine. You might be, you know, lowly enough to forgive me and let me off the hook, but there's no way that I'm going to do that for myself. That's the height of arrogance and pride. To say not only that, you're denying the power of the cross in your life. If God says you're forgiven, get on board, you're forgiven. Amen. And so sometimes we just put the language to it by saying, look, now it's time to forgive yourself. And really all that is is saying, look, this is a deeper way to fully receive the forgiveness that Christ purchased for you on the cross. If he says that I'm forgiven, then I say that I'm forgiven, right? Right? It's the second part of repentance. Third part is that we need to rebuke the enemy's hold on our life. In Ephesians 4.26, Paul you know, gives this whole bit about don't sin in your anger, and when you do get angry, don't let the sun go down. Married people, this is like great marriage advice. Gosh, I remember our first year of marriage. My wife's not here. I can just talk about her. I can just do anything I want. Remember our first year of marriage? Man, there were nights when we were staying up till 2.30, 3, 3.30 in the morning because we were not going to go to sleep until we had dealt with whatever we needed to dealt with. And I remember praying, God, help me deal with this anger because I can't keep my eyes open anymore. God's like, look, either you'll let it go or I'll just wear you out till you're so tired that you'll just walk in forgiveness and let it go, right? But there's an important point that Paul makes here. He says, look, if you don't, if you walk in anger, and he's just using anger as an example of sin in general. If you walk in anger and you hold on to it, you keep it, which is what, you know, the sun setting signifies here. It's going to create a foothold for the devil in your life. 
It's going to give him an opportunity to come and consistently harass you, tempt you in that area in a stronger way than you had been before. So when we're talking about repentance, it's not just, I've sinned and now I need to be forgiven. Yes. But it's also, I need to deal with with any footholds that I've given the enemy in my life. You know, I love how Jesus did it in Matthew 4. The devil came up and he tempted, tempted, tempted. And finally, Jesus just looked at him and said, devil, leave. Get out of here. James 4 says, resist the devil and he will flee, right? Part of true repentance, call it what it is. I'm going to receive God's forgiveness. And now because I stand fully forgiven, I'm going to look at the enemy. I'm going to look at the footholds and say, done. That stops. That leaves now in Jesus Now, I'm going to take authority and say, you don't get to harass me like this anymore, okay? And then there's the fourth and final step of repentance, and this is key. Remember, at the the foundation of of all bondage is a lie that we've believed, and we're we're going to repent of the sin in order to get free, then we also have to learn to recognize the lie and to replace that lie with with God's truth. You know, when, when Adam and Eve fell... Satan didn't force the fall on them. It's not like he overpowered them and forced them to fall. No. What did he do? He lied to them. That's it. It was pure and simple deception. And they grabbed hold of it, bought it, handed over their authority, their power, because they came into agreement with the lie of the enemy. When we're in bondage, it's the same thing. The devil doesn't come and overpower you, force you, you know. Yes, there is such a thing as demon possession, but that always comes as as a, um, how do I say this, in response to lies and agreements being made with the enemy. And so when we're talking about repenting, you know, we want to go as deep as we can. we got to get to that point of saying, well, what's the lie that I've been believing that's been empowering my anger, that's been empowering the lust, that's been empowering you know, my gossip, that's been empowering whatever this area of bondage is. What am I believing that's a lie? And typically it's going to be a lie about you, about somebody else, or about God. We're going to identify that lie, call it for what it is, renounce it, and then we're going to say, God, what do you say is true? What does your word say is true? Right? If it's shame you're dealing with, well, the word of God says... There's no condemnation. It's a lie that I've been believing, that I feel like I have to earn God's love and forgiveness. No, you don't. Jesus earned it for you. You get the picture? That's this deep level of repentance that says, I'm going down to the very bottom, to the root. We're going to dig that sucker up, and we're going to get free. Amen? Amen. You guys excited to get free? Man, I am. And it's going to start with repentance. That's going to be our focus this week. As you get your tools... As you join the group and experience the power of the Holy Spirit together as family, we're going to start with this whole thing of repentance. As you look through this, you'll see these tools and prayers and things listed out very, just very orderly in a step-by-step way. And it's going to bring about new levels of freedom for you. So here's my challenge. It's very simple. This is all I want you to do this week. Get a book. Join a group. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. And I thank you, Lord, that saving us from hell wasn't enough. You said, that's not how much I love them. I love them more than that. I want to save them from hell, and I want to set them free. I want to get them out of slavery, and I want to get the slavery out of them. Why? Because you've created us to be sons and daughters of the king, and you've created us to be free, Lord. And we're so grateful, so grateful, Jesus. So I just ask, Lord, that this would be a week as we kick this this, this season off, these three weeks of purposely looking at freedom to get free. Man, would, would it just be bathed with the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit? And would each of us really be able to grab hold of these tools so we can learn how to repent, we can learn how to forgive, we can learn how to break these judgments, and we can go deep into the freedom that you have for us. We pray now in your name, Jesus.